Hi, I'm Brendan Small. Welcome to the Carvin Channel. Well, I think I, I got my first guitar when I was around, um, I think I was 11 years old. But I pretty much thought guitar was an impossible thing that was only uh, reserved for like the gods of guitar. When I was around 14 years old, um, my neighbor, who I'm still really good friends with, um, he said, I play guitar. And we were on the bus, and I go, no, you don't. It's impossible. It's impossible to play guitar. And he goes, no, I do play guitar. And he met me after school, and he could play. He was playing stuff, and, um, and I was completely blown away. And he said, not only can I play this, but I can show you how to play it. My friend bought me a... Uh, he goes, okay, well he, showed, he introduced me to Metallica and King Diamond and then Jethro Tull and Blue Oyster Cult and everything that had a guitar in it. But he also handed me some of the, like, some of the Guitar God uh, albums, which were, uh, of course, like Satriani and Vi and Yngwie Malmsteen and all that stuff. So I, that was it. I, I, I had to learn how to do that stuff. And so then I went to music school and uh, I went to Berklee College of Music. And, um, but while I was there, I realized that there was something else that I was really excited about, which, and that was comedy, and that was writing for TV and all that stuff. So while I was taking all these different music classes and composition classes and arranging classes, I, I went over to Emerson College, which is in Boston also, and started taking um, writing for TV classes. And so when I finished music, so here's what happened. I learned how to play fast and learned how to play all this stuff right around the time where it was really uncool to play fast and to play, to even have a guitar solo. At some point, I was hanging out with another creator of another Adult Swim show, uh, Jackson Public from um, Venture Brothers, who uh, I'm pals with. And I was telling him about all this metal stuff, and he goes, I can't believe you're not creating a show that's about this whole world of metal and guitar. And I said, I can't believe you had to tell me that. I can't believe I'm so dumb that I didn't think of that myself. And so I got together with a buddy of mine, uh, Tommy Blotcha, who had been the only one in the comedy world who would go out and see these metal shows with me. So I said, let's put a show together, and I called the head of the network, and I said, I've got an idea. It's, it's, it's an extreme metal band, and I'm going to write all the music myself, because I know I can do that. And uh, I'm not necessarily interested in having anyone understand anything that anyone says on the show. And so the head of the network, to his credit, said, green light. <laughs> and it was that simple. And so we just started working and developing the world, and I sat with my guitar, and I was, and I was trying to figure out what this band was going to sound like. And uh, we were off and running, and, um, and uh, you know, we're still going now. It's been six years. I mean, the whole idea of the show is if I can do this, if I can make this show work and put a song in every episode, then maybe at the end of the season I can put out a record. I can take these little fragments of songs and expand them into full-length songs. We ended up charting really high on the uh, billboard charts and we ended up uh, hitting number 21 which was the highest uh, charting death metal album and then we put out the second record and that beat the first record's number so we ended up hitting number 15 on the billboard charts so that's now the highest charting death metal album of all time one of the coolest things I get to do with this show is I get to corner guitar heroes of mine and uh, pay them to hang out with me by giving them a voice on the show. And it turns out they're all really good actors and they're, they're charismatic and they're funny. And um, um, one of those guitar heroes of mine was Steve Vai. I said, would you like to do voices? And he said, absolutely, that'd be fun. And he came in and did voices and he was, um, uh, he was fantastic and he did a couple different voices in a couple different episodes. I, have, I, I know how lucky I am to have befriended guitar heroes such as like uh, Satriani and Vi. And to be able, like, uh, Steve Vi is so nice that I'll ask him the kind of questions I would, a, a nerdy 15 year old would ask him, you know. But I'll call him and I'll go, what kind of, hey, what kind of speaker wattage do you use? Because I'm a nerd and I want to know that stuff. And he goes, well, I'll use these and I'll use those and I'll do this stuff. And he goes, by the way, you ever tried out one of the legacy heads? And I go, no, but <laughs> this is so funny. Steve Vai said, well, uh, why don't you give me your shipping address? I'd like to send you one. And I go, that's, you're not gonna, you're gonna send me an amplifier. And he goes, well, I'm, um, yeah. And uh, he did. 
And the next thing I know, on my doorstep, there's a there's a legacy amp, and I and I was like, holy, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, and I called pretty much everyone I knew and I said, hey, no big deal or anything, but my best friend Steve I totally sent me an amplifier. And uh, I had to explain who Steve I was to my mother. And uh, once she understood who he was, it was a big deal to her. But um, so I plugged it in and it was, the first thing I noticed was that it's just fun and easy to play. First thing I noticed is that it's, it's very, um, it's very, uh, it's warm sounding, I think, and that's something that I'm always kind of interested in. So it, it plays really easily. You don't have to fight the amplifier to um, to get cool sound out of it, you know. Like I'm half-ass playing right now. I'm not even giving it my all, and it sounds like I'm hitting all the notes, right? And that's, I, sometimes a, a good amp with, that's well compressed and warm enough and just easy on the ears can just aid your playing in some ways. And I found that uh, on, the, uh, on this, this amp. And um, so I just I sat in front of it for like, you know, two days and played. And I just said, this is a really cool amp. And uh, he said, well, uh, and he didn't sell me hard on, on Carvin. He just said, this is, you yeah, know, oh, good. You want to... He said, I think there are some people that know about your cartoon over there. You want to talk to them? I said, sure. Okay. Um, you say they're big fans? Oh, sure, I'll talk to them then. So, in between the first and second record, I didn't know if I was, I didn't know if I was going to do a second Death Clock record. Um, it, it was kind of a long, drawn-out thing with the Adult Swim label. I have everyone on hold, so I have Gene Hoagland. Um, I have Brian Beller, who's an amazing bass player who played with Steve Vai. And... Um, and Mike Keneally, and uh, and then I have my engineer Ulrich Wild, who engineered the first Death Clock record. And they're all sitting there waiting for me to negotiate this deal. And I said, I don't think this deal's going to happen. But you know what? Let's all go in the studio because I've got I've got a ton of songs that I'd like to record with you guys, and maybe it'll end up being a different project. It's more of a rock album, and it's it's with the same people that do Death Clock. It's the exact same people, but it's a little bit more melodic. I'm singing melodic vocals. It's not. I don't sound like Louis Armstrong on this record like I do on the Death Clock records. I'm gonna make this whole record and it's gonna be a solo album and it's gonna be this this whole, I'm trying to coin the phrase high stakes intergalactic uh, extreme rock and roll. And that's what I am doing. So it's all these influences from ELO to Queen to like 90s Seattle stuff to modern black metal and just thinking about tone. And it was a really cool opportunity to really use these guys over here, the, the legacy. Okay, so here's 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 a basically. I mean, when I go in, when I'm looking for a distorted sound, I, I learn more every single day. And I, like I said, I have the luxury of asking. I ask a bunch of stupid questions that I think people knew long before I did. But I'm learning a lot about production as as I continue with uh, you know my record, with all the stuff I do with Death Clock, with all the scoring stuff I do. You can hear from the beginning of the episodes to season three and to the future of, of Metalocalypse you'll be able to hear the sound quality getting slightly better along the way as I learn little tricks and stuff and I bother my friends and I learn or I get a new plug-in or I do some kind of like, you know, mastering kind of like whatever. I get some new software. And um, when I dial in a guitar sound, for the most part, I'm thinking of something that is, that makes me feel comfortable playing. And that's the most important thing. And then I like to have um, as much kind of like harmonic content as I can so when I dial in a guitar tone, it's a very simple thing, and um, I actually looked at the I actually looked at the ma the manual that this came that came with this, and um, and it actually shows you some good settings, and I actually read those, and um, and uh, as a young guitarist, I would just take the drive and dime it as far as I could just to see how much. But the more you back away, the kind of clearer the sound is, and the the more I play guitar. <laughs> I want to hear. I want to hear the guitar like underneath everything. I want to. That's why um, I. I'll use different pickups constantly, but the more I play, the more I kind of like to have less output. I like to have more of a medium output, so I can hear the the guitar and the pick in my hand and the skin of your fingers kind of interacting. Um, um, 
So I don't have it, I guess I've got it at four, which is a reasonably loud thing, but I have an, an isolation room. So, um... Um, I'm also, I like, I mean, the more I play guitar, the more I, I go for the frown curve kind of EQ where I have more mids than, uh, you know, in metal, they used to scoop mids all the time because I think they had a hard time finding the place for, uh, it would just make your guitar sound, but now when you listen to metal albums, I hear so much, so many more mids. Another stupid thing I didn't know about amplifiers is that an amplifier sounds like itself and you can kind of adjust the parameters to a degree, and if the amplifier doesn't sound like the sound you want, you can't twist knobs until it sounds right. It usually has the good sound, and then you can put a little bit more or less of the tone in it if you want. And that's how I think of this amp, is that it already sounds good, and I can't really screw it up, no matter how many ways I try. So, um, so I usually get a good sound. And uh, this is my favorite channel, the channel three on the Legacy thing. You see, I can... I have these things all just down right now because I've been using this one to record with the most. And this has been the, this has been the, um, I guess the, the sound that I've been using. It sounds like something Steve I would play too, so it makes, it's in, uh, it's in his uh, ballpark of sound too, which I think is kind of cool. Okay, so, um, I'm just screwing around here, but um, the sound that you're hearing is not like, I don't have a distortion pedal in front of this, and there's a little bit of delay from a plug-in that I'm using, because I have the amplifier in the other room with a microphone in front of it. But the microphone is going to a Focusrite preamp with a totally flat EQ, so what the microphone is hearing is exactly what the sound that the amp is making, so there's no extra thing in front of it. And this amp doesn't need uh, like a booster pedal in front of it, because it's got enough... <laughs> It's got enough gain, and uh, I just have a little bit of delay, and when I, nine times out of ten, if you're playing licks that are kind of fast or whatever, you know, like, like things like that, like, you don't want too much stuff in the way. You don't want to start putting chorus and extra distortion and stuff. You want it to get it as clean as possible so that if you play it right, it sounds right. So I recently tried out this amp, the Carvin, um, the Vintage Tube, which is a 50-watt amp, right? Yeah, told you. And um, it's really cool. It's a two-channel amp that um, has a really sparkly clean that that reminds me of like a, a blackface kind of fendery kind of sound. And if you turn it up nice and loud to around six or something, you get that nice kind of like it gets it breaks up in a really great way. And um, it sounds it's just it's really these amps sound good. And then. Um, this one, uh, the dirtier side is, you can get very blues to like, I think you can you can play rock and roll to metal if you want to, depending on the, I mean, I think you can play metal on any amp if you want to. I don't think there's one metal amp, but really fun, great, kind of cool classic rock sound out of this side. And uh, as a guitarist, you know, I, I guess it's my job. I'm known for playing metal stuff, but, and I love metal, but I also really like, other styles of music too, so I always like to be able to have something that's super versatile that you can um, you can toggle between like stuff like you know I, I like um, I love Larry Car Carlton's guitar playing with Steely Dan stuff, and I always like his kind of sounds that he gets, and I love Jeff Beck, and uh, it's not you know searing metal, it's tone and it's uh, backing off on the gain and all that stuff, and. Uh, the guitar playing is good, it's going to sound really good. And um, so, this is a really cool versatile amp. And uh, it's, a, it's cool to pair this with that, too, because they, um, they both do uh, cool different things, but they both sound like they're coming from the same ballpark, which is cool. Hey, this is Brendan, uh, and um, again, I am Brendan still, and it's been a pleasure talking to you guys uh, on the Carbon Channel. So I'll see you all real soon. Bye.